Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Eleni Azales from Suburban Hostels Community Health and Wellness Depart Department. Um, thank you all for joining us on this beautiful spring day. Uh, today we have Arshna Sangha from Rock Creek Dermatology. Uh, she will be talking to us about how to care for the skin we're in um, and how to keep it healthy. Uh, before we begin, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. The first is, as you can hear, as you heard, this meeting has this webinar is being recorded, so we'll make it available in the coming days. Secondly, um, secondly, questions and answers. I'm sure people have have questions. Um, if you do have a question, we'll be answering at the end of the presentation. Um, but please use the question answer box on the bottom of the screen. It says Q and A, so we'll be taking questions through that. And the final and most important housekeeping item is the evaluation. So once the Zoom webinar has finished, um, you'll be redirected to a link. So please take the time to complete the webinar, not the webinar, the evaluation. Uh, we take the feedback very seriously. It helps us with future programming. Um, if you have suggestions for future topics, we'd love to hear them. So please take the time to fill out the evaluation. So without further ado, um, Arshna, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I think the last time you presented was back in July. So now that we've gone through fall and winter, and now we're heading into spring, I'm sure that there are things that we need to do to care for the skin we're in. So we'll get started. Thank you again. Wonderful. Thank you, Eleni. And it's so great to be back with this group again. Um, I hope the past year you have all been keeping well, and I'm excited to speak with you on this spring day about how to protect the skin you're in. And again, my name is Arch Nasanga. I am a um, board certified dermatology PA practicing here in Silver Spring, Maryland, and also in our Bethesda, Maryland locations. So when we're talking about protecting your, the skin you're in, I wanted to first and foremost with this beautiful spring weather, talk to you about some of the most serious uh, skin concerns, and then we'll get into some everyday routine things you should be doing to protect your skin. So let's get into one of my most common complaints uh, in my clinical practice here, which are actinic keratoses. Many patients come in and say, I need a cream that's gonna get rid of this dry patch of skin, whether it's, as you can see on the left-hand side of um, this slide on the nose, or whether it's on the arms, as in this middle photo, or the zoomed up photo here on the right-hand side, where it's just this kind of pink patch of skin with a little bit of what my patients describe as dry flaking or crusting. And then, you know, after I ask them a few more questions, they'll say, well, you know, it's kind of been here for about six or seven months and it comes and it goes. And no amount of lotion I put on it seems to ever get rid of it completely. Well, that's a telltale sign for me that it's an early pre-cancer of the skin. Again, the term is called actinic because it's coming from sun exposure and keratosis because it's rough. So when I see this, it's, it's great because it's pre-cancer, right? So it's not skin cancer. And there's lots of different ways in office that I treat it. The most common treatment is called liquid nitrogen or cryotherapy. And that's when you use that cold spray. Some of you may have had warts growing up as a child. It's the same cold spray. We haven't changed much there. Um, and that will cause a blistering reaction at that site. And then several days later, it will take off the precancer. Over the years, there's been no, newer uh, treatment options available. So sometimes I'll use a cream. Um, there's also light therapies that will help as well. So that is called actinic keratosis. And again, a precancer of the skin. If you notice something that's dry and flaking, not going away, um, best to have it checked out. So next we have the three most common skin cancers. We're gonna start off with basal cell, then move into squamous cell. And then last but not least, we'll talk about melanoma. So basal cell skin cancer, as you can see here in this middle photo, this almost looks like a little pimple. And that's what the majority of my patients will come in and describe this as. Archna, this has been on my face, um, you know, for the last two months. It's a pimple that just won't go away. If I pick at it, it bleeds and it oftentimes takes a long time to stop bleeding. 
Um, those are usually the complaints that, that happen with basal cells. And this is the most common, not only skin cancer, but cancer in the US. Um, so this is very, very, very common. And it is caused by sun exposure. So if you see something like this, like this pearly papule here, it almost looks like it has this um, rolled border to it and this kind of divoted center, that's a sign that you should have it checked out. Um, but it can also look differently. It can also look like this little pink patch, almost similar to the photos that I showed you just prior, um, but without as much crusting. When in doubt, again, best thing to do is just get it checked out. The next skin cancer we'll talk about is called squamous cell. This is the second most common skin cancer. About 700,000 Americans per year are diagnosed with it. Um, this skin cancer is thick. It has that, what we call as hyperkeratotic crusting, which just means this roughness to it. Um, it also bleeds very easily for many of my patients. Very common to have this on sun exposed areas. As you can see, this patient on the right here has it on their um, on the rim of their ear, the helical rim here. Uh, so this is again, the second most common skin cancer, very, very um, common in my sun worshipers and my farmers. Um, next, we have melanoma. This is the most deadly skin cancer. And oftentimes patients will come in and say, you know, I just um, noticed this new mole and it's been rapidly changing. And I noticed it over the past month or two. Um, so anytime there's a new or changing mole, it is very important to have that checked by a dermatology practice. Um, the reason being is we wanna make sure it's not a precancerous mole or that it's not a melanoma. We wanna keep you safe. These are examples of melanoma and you can see they vary. They can either be jet black, like this left-handed photo, this modeled appearance here, um, where you can see different shades of brown and skin tones in the center here. And then you can have what we call as like a superficial spreading melanoma on the right-hand side, which is this kind of flat patch of all different shades of brown. Here. So it can present in a variety of different ways. I've even seen um, melanomas in my clinic that have no pigment um, called amelanotic. So melanomas can look in a variety of different ways. So one way uh, to kind of figure out, is this something to be concerned about, is something called ABCDEs of melanoma. This is an easy way to just kind of keep track of your moles and they stand for a couple different things. A is asymmetry. So when you're looking at a mole, let's say you have a mole on your arm that you can look at while I'm talking you through this, look and see if the mole has any um, irregular borders to it. If it doesn't match up, if you were to divide it in half, um, one half doesn't match the other half it would be asymmetric, right? Uh, so that would be one area that would be irregular. But then you go to the next step. Are the borders notched? Are they not smooth? That would be another little tick that you would check off the list. And how about the color? Is the color different throughout the mole? Is part of it blue and another part of it pink? Um, so that's something you wanna keep track of. The diameter. Has the, has the mole, um, is the mole larger than a pencil eraser? So a pencil eraser is about six millimeters. Is it larger than that? And last, but definitely not least, this is what I consider one of the most important characteristics is evolution. Ha is the mole rapidly changing? Uh, that's, that's to me one of the most um, important characteristics that I always want to know about when I'm doing a skin check. Have you noticed any new or changing mole? So we're always screening um, for that. And many of my patients say, listen, honey, I have so many moles. I cannot keep track of them. That's why I come see you guys. So that's A-OK -okay too, um, to just come in for a skin check yearly. So that's just talking briefly of um, the top three skin cancers the most common skin cancers that we see in practice and also the actinic keratosis, the precancer. But now we're gonna get into a little bit of a lighter part of the uh, talk, which are my, the top skin conditions that I see in practice, 
for my patients who are 60 and over. So age spots, right? Everybody asks about these. Are they okay? Um, is it something I need to worry about? And what exactly are they? They are flat brown patches um, of pigment on the skin in sun exposed areas. And they oftentimes patients will say, well, I haven't been in the sun in over 20 years. And they're right. You know, these oftentimes formed um, very early on that sun damage happened oftentimes before they're even 18 years of age. Um, they've had, you know, a significant amount of sun exposure and then years, decades later, they start showing up with the brown spots. Um, and that's very common and typical and expected as well. They're not dangerous. They can be cosmetically unsightly for many of my patients. And so there are lots of different cosmetic procedures we do to help lighten these. Um, IPL laser, which is intel intense pulse light laser is one of the most common treatments. There's also bleaching creams, uh, vitamin C serums, multitudes of things that can be done to improve the appearance, but they're not dangerous, more so cosmetically bothersome. So next we have subarachic keratoses. Many of my patients will confuse these for moles because they're, they're raised and they're brown in many of my patients. But when I look with my uh, dermatoscope, which is just a magnifier that I use in office, I can see certain characteristics. So if you look really closely at the center photo, you will see this kind of stucco appearance to them, almost like you can peel it off. And believe it or not, some of my patients say, I peeled it off and it grew back, um, or I couldn't get all the brown off. I don't recommend you do that. But, um, but that's where you know they get their name. It's that keratosis, that's, that thickening of the skin uh, that has almost a wart-like texture to it. And these can occur anywhere on the body, but they're most common on the face and on the trunk. Uh, they happen for several reasons. Genetics is number one. Um, so if mom or dad or cousin, um, siblings, anybody in the family has them, you're more likely to get them. And um, age, they often, I call them lovingly wisdom spots, but many of my patients uh, consider them barnacles. So they typically start showing up in your 40s and they continue to multiply um, from there. They're not, they're not dangerous, but again, can be cosmetically bothersome. Um, and in some patients, you know, depending on the location, they can uh, irritate with, be irritated with clothing. So there are treatment options for them in office, a wide variety. These can be removed. Next are um, a growth called cherry angiomas. These are just blood vessels that are on the skin. Um, they're essentially a small blood vessel tumor. They're not dangerous at all. Uh, just like with the subarachic keratosis, once you have one, you can find others. And they also um, tend to show up as we get wiser. So not dangerous, can be treated with laser in office. Um, but it's almost like playing whack-a-mole, if you will. If you get rid of one, inevitably there's going to be another one that shows up elsewhere on the body. So I tell patients, yes, we can get rid of the ones that you don't like if they're cosmetically bothersome, but keep in mind that you will continue to grow them because they have that genetic component to them. And then next, similar to the subarachic keratoses, these are called stucco keratoses. And Again, these are just um, a lots of tiny little, almost wart-like growths around the ankles, the lower legs of the body. Um, oftentimes I can see, you know, 50 to 100 of them on a patient, not dangerous in any way, um, not contagious either. They tend to occur again in families. Um, so something to keep in mind, a lot of patients will think that it's dry skin and they'll just keep trying to hydrate their skin. Um, but it is not dry skin. It's actually a skin growth called a stucco keratosis, which is not dangerous, but could be cosmetically annoying. Um, there's some prescription creams that I will use in office to help minimize the appearance if they're really itchy or bothersome for a patient. And then next we have asteatotic eczema. Right now we're getting out of the, the cold winter months here and into this beautiful spring. But this is the most common time that I would see um, and treat asteatotic eczema, which just gets its name from 
it's like this uh, riverbed drying appearance to the skin. That's where it gets its name from. So you can see here how cracked the skin is, how red and dehydrated it looks. The best way to treat this are with um, thick emollient creams. I really like a couple of uh, manufacturers that do a good job with their products. Um, Cetaphil, CeraVe are probably my top two. They have uh, ceramides in them and uh, glycerin, and they just really do a great job in hydrating that dry cracked skin. So it's really important to, after you take a lukewarm shower, yes, I said lukewarm. I love hot showers, but they dehydrate the skin um, so lukewarm. And when you get out of the shower, you pat yourself dry, your skin should still be damp. And then you would moisturize your entire body with, um, with one of those emollient rich moisturizers that I just mentioned. There's several of them on the market. Those just happen to be two of my go-tos. And new for this year, I thought I'd add in a few slides about think, thanks to COVID-19, you know, we're all wearing our face masks to be safe and slow the spread. But I have lots of patients over 60 who are coming in and saying, you know what, I am just too old to be getting acne. Why am I getting acne? And then I look and see, and it's exactly where their mask fits. In fact, in the dermatology community, we've termed this mask me. Um, and it is indeed from wearing the masks. Masks are great at preventing, um, at preventing the spread of COVID. However, they really do a number on our skin. Um, so they, they trap, you know, sweat and uh, dirt on our, on our faces. And so that's what's really causing these acne breakouts. And so a couple of things to just keep in mind um, when you're wearing masks is if you're choosing to wear a cloth face mask, please make sure you change that every day. Or if you're heavily perspiring, make sure you change it, you know, um, as soon as you get home or in the car, you wanna make sure you to have a clean mask on your face. Uh, you also wanna make sure you're washing your cloth masks. So I have lots of patients who have, um, you know, a basket full of masks and they're constantly changing them, but what they're forgetting to do is wash their masks. So they, they do need to be washed um, if you're not using the disposable throw the disposable throwaway mask. So that's number one, make sure your mask is clean and, um, and that you're changing it if you're heavily perspiring or sweating. Number two would be make sure you're washing your face um, at least twice a day. So morning and night with a gentle skin cleanser. I do like uh, Cetaphil or CeraVe again, because they're so gentle on the skin and they're over the counter. So that would be the next thing I, I would recommend is to wash your face twice a day. And then the third thing is apply a barrier repair cream. So especially along this jawline area, you want to put on um, Vanny Ply is a great company that I like. They have a great moisturizing cream. And what that helps uh, prevent is that friction of the mask. So if your skin is protected somewhat, from that and that's what we're noticing is causing some increased breakouts is that um, rubbing. So another thing to consider is put that barrier repair cream on. And last but not least is if you're in the car by yourself or um, you know in with the only the closest members of your family who you've always been maskless with, take a mask break, take off the mask. Um, it's recommended that after every four hours of wearing your mask, if you're in an area that you can do so safely, take at least a 15 minute um, mask break. So it, while I'm in clinic, I'm wearing mask, um, you know, the entire day, but I do like to on my break, um, just take my mask off when I'm in my office on alone, just to give myself a little bit of breathing room there. So those are, those are some tips on how to, um, you know, treat and prevent mask knee, which is, which is a slide I never thought I'd be putting in, you know, two years ago, but here we are. And I'd like to end on a popular um, area here that we had last year, lots of questions about sun safety uh, with what types of sunscreens to use and how to protect your skin. Definitely during the peak hours of, um, of the sun, which is 10 to four for us, you wanna make sure that you have um, sun protective clothing on if you're outdoors enjoying a nice hike or going on a walk. You want to uh, wear a nice broad brimmed hat, have your sunglasses on. 
you want to use a sunscreen um, that ideally protects against UVA and UVB um, rays. So that's going to be the best thing to use. And you want to make sure that sunscreen is at least an SPF of 50, 5 zero. That's really important. But what's even more important is to remember to reapply it. So lots of folks will put on the sunscreen in the morning, then they'll be gone for maybe a four or five hour excursion and they'll forget to reapply. And that's how you get, um, you know, the sunburned, you get um, all of those damaging effects of the rays. So make sure that you're using a good sunscreen. Here I have La Roche-Posay, which is a company um, that you know we you can find available at CVS. Very common, um, great brand here. They do a great job with their sunscreen, and then also Neutrogena, which you can find just about everywhere. Great, great sunscreen. Um, there's lots of great brands out there. Make sure it's an SPF of 50. Uh, lots of my patients think, well, you know, I use an SPF of 100, so I figured that I could not reapply for twice the amount of time. So they'll say, you know, instead of reapplying every two hours, I just reapplied every four hours, but inevitably they would have gotten burned by then. So it doesn't matter if it's over 50, you still have to reapply um, every 90 minutes to 120 minutes. So every two hours is safe. And like I mentioned earlier in the presentation, if there's ever a question, uh, you know, it's best not to Google. Google's always gonna get, always gonna scare you. It's best just to make an appointment. Um, a lot of offices are, you know, offering telehealth or in-office visits. I see 99% of my patients in office. Um, when in doubt, just have it checked out would be my recommendation. And I just want to thank you for your time today. And I uh, look forward to answering some of your questions. And I hope this was helpful for you. Great. Thank you. So um, uh, the first question is, can you please repeat the names of the creams that you mentioned? And I'm going to write them down. Sure. Perfect. So a couple of... Um, I'll just repeat all of them yes. because I'm not sure if they're referring to sunscreen or if they're referring to the moisturizers. But for moisturizers, the company that I like, and, and also for cleansers, the companies that I like are called Cetaphil, which is C-E-T-A-P-H-I-L, Cetaphil, and then CeraVe, which is C-E-R-A-V-E. That's for cleansers and moisturizers. Um, they also make great sunscreens. I really do like the La Roche-Posay line. They do a great job with their sunscreen. Um, and that was on that previous slide. So I could probably go back to that slide to show you, but it's uh, L-A-R-O-C-H-E, La Roche-Posay, P-O-S-A-Y. Um, and Neutrogena, of course, they, they do a great job as well. And the biggest thing you're looking for for sunscreen, again, is really that number. You want to look for an SPF of 50, 5, 0. Um, and if they, if they block against UV and UVB lights, that would be raised. That would be great. Was, uh, was the, um, the jaw cream La Roche or is that the sunscreen? The, the jaw cream. So if, if we're talking about like for... Um, for maskne and for kind mm -hmm. of preventing that. I really like Vanny Ply. It's Vanny a, cream. Uh-huh. It's V-A-N-I-P-L-Y um, is the company and they make cream, lotion, all of those things. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Um, so are there any ways to prevent these skin problems that you mentioned? So the biggest thing is, uh, protection, sun protection. So making sure that you have your sunscreen on and you're just dressed smart for sun protection, right? Wearing that broad brimmed hat, your sunglasses. Um, now there's, you know, sun protective clothing as well that has uh, UVA, UVB protection both in. So that's really nice. Lots of my patients, um, 60 and above say, well, if most of my damage is done when I, when I was um, younger than 18, what's the point of doing anything now? And I always tell them there, you know, it's always a good idea to protect your skin now because years down the line, you're going to reap what you've done now, right? So if you didn't invest in your skin, 
you're going to you're going to see those detrimental effects on um, years down the line. So it's important. It's never too late to start is what I tell my patients. That is true. Um, can you talk a bit about, I'm going to try to say this, uh, osmosis, O-N-Y-C-H-O-M-Y-C-O-S-I-S. Mm, let me see if I can see the, um, the question because I have to look at it. Yeah, um, I, I, yeah, I'm sorry. That's okay. That's a good one for me. Circle back around to that one. Sure. Um, a sores in the mouth. Of oh, onychomycosis. Okay, I see it. I was able to. I was able to see it. Can yeah. You repeat so, that again. <laughs> um. Sure. So it's onychomycosis. Onychomycosis. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Um. So onychomycosis just means toenail fungus, and oh. and uh, the way that you can tell if you have it is you you, you can look at your toenail and it often is thickened. And it has this kind of yellow discoloration to it. Um, sometimes it's very dry as well. And so for onychomycosis, there's lots of different treatment options available. The most common would be an oral medication, an oral antifungal um, that you're on for about three months. And then um, newer options include and newer nail lacquers that have come out and that have shown to be more effective than the old ones that we used to have about 20 plus years ago. So um, there's lots of options there. I would just encourage whoever's asking the question to, um, to just consult with your dermatology practice. Great, thank you. Um, so, oh, um, did you, so you didn't discuss warts. Do you wanna to touch on warts for a little bit? Sure, yeah, absolutely. So, there's lots of different types of warts, but I'll talk about just the most common one, which is, which are plantar warts. Um, those oftentimes patients will say, how did I get them? Truthfully, we don't know. Um, there was a crack or a compromise in your skin and warts come from a virus. Um, so you picked up the virus on some sort of, usually you know, um, communal surface there and that was infected with it and you picked it up and there's lots of treatment options available for them from over the counter using compound W solution. Um, solution is what I like better than the spray. It seems to be more effective. So you put on the solution at night, wash it off in the morning, um, do that for several months because that's oftentimes how long it takes to treat them when you're doing over the counter. In office, I'll freeze them with liquid nitrogen. I'll do different topical therapies as well. Uh, so there's lots of lots of options there, uh, get them treated because they're contagious. So they like to spread to other areas of the body, typically the other foot or the fingers because you're touching your feet. Great. Um, oh, here we have a question about derma abrasion brushes. Are they good to use for the face wash? And then um, do you have, I guess, and then it says such as oil volet. So we, would you, I guess, what are your thoughts about derma abrasion brushes? Sure. So I'm guessing they're they're talking more so about like um, clarisonic brushes, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I personally, so couple couple ways that you could use them. Um, you could use them once a week. I personally don't like them. I think that you can um, do a great job by just using your fingers, massaging the skin for about 20 seconds with a nice cleanser, then rinsing it off and patting it dry. Um, the reason I don't like dermabrasion brushes is because of course, uh, my view's a little tainted. I always see the adverse side effects of things. So I see the patients who've overused them and are red and have caused these dilated blood vessels on their skin or have more acne breakouts because they're, they haven't been um, cleansed properly. You know, so I see all of those things. If you have a great dermabrasion brush and um, my recommendation would be, if you have it at home, great. Use it once a week, no more than that. Um, make sure you clean it thoroughly. All it's doing is to help exfoliate your skin. That's all it's trying to do. Um, don't overuse it. I know some of those companies say use it every day. Please don't do that. It's, it's too strong to do that every day. Yeah, and then I guess also with that, um, I've seen products that suck out the, the stuff. Yeah. 
Yes, same same sort of thing. I I like to tell folks to avoid them. Um, you know, it's it's just that thing where when you're when you haven't been trained right, and there's this device, there's that tendency to overdo it, mm -hmm. and um, I think you you end up with having more problems than yeah. any benefit. So I like to keep things simple. If you just properly take care of your skin in those simple steps, cleanse hydrate um, and protect, I really, you know, the majority of those issues can be solved. And if it needs more, just come in and, and see us. Good. Um, uh, and it's also the ick, fa ick factor too, um, for some. <laughs> um, anyway, moving on. So um, question here, I've developed some rough areas on my skin, lower leg, for example, I've used Cetaphil to after shower, but I can't get rid of can't get those areas smooth. Any other ideas? Yeah. So that patient, that um, that that person sounds like they need they need to be seen because it sounds like they would probably benefit with a prescription topical steroid. Um, it needs to be evaluated because if they've tried Cetaphil several times for you know four to six weeks, it, it's time to get seen. Um, when a teen, oh my gosh, a, a antinetic keratosis seems to come back after being removed. What is going on? My concern is that, of course, it's precancerous nature. Yeah. Yeah. And Eleni, I promise you, they just came up with these like terminologies just to make us look smart. I mean, it could just be <laughs> precancer. It's just, you know, <laughs> so, um, so actinic keratosis, um, come, the, the question is it's come back, right? After it's been removed. It needs to be um, reevaluated. So, for example, um, if I have a patient who I do the most common treatment, which is that liquid nitrogen, and that same exact spot, you know, three months down the road comes back, um, we either A, have to be more aggressive. So, I'll either offer the patient to refreeze it and then do a topical chemotherapy cream that um, is very common for the treatment of actinic keratosis or AKs and then see them back two months after that to see if it's resolved or B, I'll just say, you know, let's just cut to the chase and um, do a small biopsy and make sure this is just a precancer and hasn't transformed. So if there's anything recurring after treatment, it needs to be reevaluated. Okay. Um, a question here, how many hours before reapplying sunscreen? Yeah, so great question. Um, if you're not heavily perspiring, heavily sweating, the rule of thumb is two hours. Okay. If you're swimming, heavily sweating, and that sunscreen you know is coming off as soon as um, you can reapply. I, I feel like these questions are going from like cosmetic to um, medical. You're keeping me on my toes. That's yeah, good. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So here's, an, oh, this is a great one. What is the best cream for your neck? And just how, do we, <laughs> Oh, I, you know, we, we always say if we can, if we can solve hair loss and if we could um, tighten skin with just a cream, we would all be retired as the joke amongst. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what's the best cream for the neck? Um, you know, I think it really depends on what you're looking to do. So if it's that like sagging skin that, that we get as we age, right? Um, there's something called Nectifirm, which which is a great which is a great cream. Um, it's sold in dermatology offices. I think you can get it online now. I'm not sure, mm -hmm. um, but that's a good one. But really, all of all those creams, all they're doing is giving you the appearance of mildly tightening the skin, but it's really not permanently doing that, right? So it's just giving you the appearance of improvement. Yeah, the neck is a hard one for for creams. Um, retinols do help. So like Retin-A um, would help to some degree, but not make a major difference. It depends if we're talking about laxity or, um, or loose skin, I should say, or wrinkling or both. Yeah. I guess the only thing is just to keep your neck. If it's like what, what we call is like a turkey gobble where you can actually yeah. pinch it and feel fat there, there's different cosmetic treatments that can be done to dissolve that fat. Yeah. Okay. But if it's just that loose skin, that's that's actually more difficult to treat. And yeah, the creams will help a little bit. Mm. Um, oh, so what should someone do about spider veins? Remove them? 
Yeah, so the, the technical, I guess the, the correct answer would be, what do you want to do about them, right? Mm -hmm. If they don't bother you, you don't have to do anything, but I'm guessing they asked a question because they, they bother them. Um, there's laser treatments that can be done. There's also sclerotherapy, which um, we inject those veins to, to get rid of them. So lots of different things can be done um, more and more, though laser seems to be more popular. Um, so that would be the way to go. If they're bothering you, consult with the vein specialist for sure. Okay. Um, is, there, is there any real reason to exfoliate the skin? So you were talking about like the scrub brushes, but is there, um, but what about like those, you know, um, not necessarily salt scrubs because that's kind of drying, but like, a, I guess. Yeah, so is there any reason to actually exfoliate it you, so, you know, when we exfoliate the skin, we're really just trying to speed up the skin turnover process, right? We're trying to take off that top layer of skin because we all want to look like we have glowing skin. And so that's what that exfoliation process is doing. It's taking up that um, stratum corneum, which is that top layer of our skin to get rid of it so it can expose the newer, fresher skin right underneath so that we look more youthful. Um, so that's the main reason to do it. But is there a medically necessary reason to do it? No, you don't have to. And your body, you know, when functioning optimally, it's already doing that for you. But like anything else, we, we usually want it done faster. <laughs> yeah. So besides, I guess, here's the question, besides, you know, creams and, and, and washes and, and sunscreen, what, what are other things that we can do to keep our skin healthy? Yeah, so healthy, like more youthful or? More youthful, less, more hydrated. Yeah, yeah, so other, well, you know, other than doing all of those things you mentioned, Eleni, diet plays a huge role, staying hydrated, mm -hmm. drinking your water. Um, truthfully, your skin is a reflection of um, what's going on internally, right? Mm -hmm. So that's actually why I got into dermatology is because I was fascinated that your body tells a story by your skin. Um, and so it's really important to make sure you're eating a healthy diet, getting your exercise. Uh, all of those things make play a huge impact into skin health. Um, and also like avoiding activities like smoking, that ages your skin tremendously. Um, so just taking really good overall care of yourself, it really pays off not only on your appearance, but internally as well. I agree. <laughs> um, I just want to quickly remind everyone, if you do have a question, please use the question and answer box. I don't know if the chat function is working right now, but you just use the question and answer box. Um, oh, what about Aquaphor for dry, itchy areas like the lips? Yes, I love Aquaphor. I love Aquaphor. Absolutely too. love Aquaphor. Um, works beautifully. The they also have an Aquaphor lip balm with an SPF of thirty. I think I have it in my purse over here. <laughs> um, so I I absolutely love Aquaphor. Works well. Uh, great for lips. Even the regular Aquaphor is great for lips. I think the biggest um, pushback I get from my patients is it is so greasy. And mm -hmm. so they don't have a problem using it in the fall or winter, but when we get to spring and summer, harder for me to get folks to use it. But if you don't mind that um, greasy feeling, I love it. I would use it. I use it on my kids all the time. Um, are Millie and Letigo skin conditions common with age? Yeah, Millia are, um, yeah. you know, I had a patient who, recently referred to them as skin pearls, which I thought was fascinating. Um, so, <laughs> and they, they literally look like these tiny little um, white dots underneath the skin and they are common um, as you age. They are definitely more common in sun exposed areas. Um, they're also common with if you're wearing newer, more occlusive uh, makeup. So heavy makeups uh, make, make that more, more common. Um, lentigos, yes, lentigo, all that means is a sun damaged brown spot. So absolutely more common as we age, yes. Um, oh, a question here about, uh, uh, does biotin work for thinning hair? If anything else, does anything else work? 
I know that see that was thicker. question number two right that we would all be retired if we had something <laughs> um, that works really well for thinning hair because that is the million dollar question um biotin can help support hair growth right but there's really not been any conclusive studies that say yes we've seen significant growth with um with biotin and does anything else help with thinning hair? So it depends. It depends what's causing the thinning hair. Is it your genetics? Is it um, a really stressful period in your life? Because you can have hair falling out for, from just stress, which will grow back beautifully once that stressful period is over. Um, so I would say that person needs to be evaluated. Oftentimes I'll do blood work to rule out a systemic cause um, make sure there's nothing else going on in the body like thyroid disease, anemia, those sorts of things. Yeah, so I would say I would tell that person to um, to get a get a workup done first. Um, yeah, it's just like the stress of COVID. I'm sure has affected people's hair and skin and yes. Um, yes. Oh, so recommended SPF for skin is? Did you say fifty? Five zero. Five yeah. zero. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then what recommended SPF for the lips? Thirty. Great question. They sell it at 30? Mm -hmm. uh, let me see if I have my aquifer. I'm going to move away and see here. This is 15. I have a 30 somewhere in here. Oh, I probably can't find it when I need it right now. But um, yeah, so they, they, they sell it at 30. If you have a 15, I'm A-OK -okay with it. Mm -hmm. um, it. 15 is better than zero. But they and do any, have a 30. Anything else? Um, so if like you don't want to use aquaphor for your lips because it's too greasy, yeah. anything else? For as far as just lip balm? Yeah. Um, you know, I I really do like um, Vaseline actually makes a, a pretty decent one. The company Vaseline Intensive, they make a pretty decent one. Um, yeah, if you, if you don't like to have um, like really hydrated lips, I would go with that. But I would encourage that person to try um, Aquaphor Lip Balm, which is completely different than the Aquaphor, the greasy ointment base that you're thinking of, because the lip balm is more like a Vaseline, but it hydrates better than the Vaseline. Yeah, so completely different. Okay. Um, these are some great questions. I'm like, I know these are <laughs> I thought of that question. Um, it's all about skincare. Um, what what is really helpful for aging skin? You know, like products come out with collagen and peptides and vitamin C and hydrolytic lactose. Yeah, the hydro, the hyaluronic acid, right? Yes. Yes. So what what's what I mean, what should we look, be looking for? And to add to that question, second question, yeah, any cr cruelty free products that you uh, recommend? Yeah, so as far as what should you be looking for, Eleni, I always go back to what are your goals? Is it to mm -hmm. brighten your skin? If you're brightening your skin, if you're looking to brighten your skin, um, I love vitamin C. I love it in the serum form. Um, there is a company that I use in office. You can buy it also online. It's called IS Clinical or is clinical. Um, they, for the cruelty-free question, they are a great company. Um, they're out in California. They do a great job. I, I love their line. So there's a serum called Gen X C, which is basically, I call it vitamin C on steroids. Um, it is a powerhouse. So it's going to brighten your skin. It's going to minimize fine lines and wrinkles. It's going to help uh, treat your age spots. And it's also going to um, just give you that glow. Right. And so it's a serum. So you'd put it on uh, usually twice a day. I have patients wash their face, put it on right after washing their face morning and night. Yeah. So that's a great when when you're looking at over the counter products. I know there's a lot that are out there that are maybe, you know, anywhere from 15 to 30 bucks. Um, or you can go to like Nordstrom and you're looking for, you know, upwards of spending two, three, four, five hundred dollars. I've had patients tell me I always tell folks like it's really important to invest in the science of skin. So you can have vitamin C, but if it's in a size and a molecule size that is not going to actually get into that dermal, that epidermis layer, it's just going to sit on that top. What's the point? It's not doing the heavy lifting. So it's really important to know the skin technology and know that you want those smaller molecules so they can actually get into the skin and do the lifting you need it to do. 
So invest in, um, I would say medical grade skincare. If you're going to put the money into it, invest there. The cheapest um, over the counter that's going to do the most is that sunscreen. I cannot say that enough. It will do a lot more than some of those other products advertised they will. Yeah, because it's protecting the skin. Yes. Sun exposure. Okay, so what, moving on to sunscreen, mm -hmm. can you give a quick, I don't know if you talked about it, but the difference between um, chemical sunscreen and a physical sunscreen blocker. Sure, no, I did not talk about it, but a chemical sunscreen is going to absorb into your skin mm -hmm. and then it's going to protect that chemical is then going to protect those rays when the um, when the sun hits the rays, whereas a physical blocker is not being absorbed in your skin. It's actually creating like this occlusive layer. So it is sitting on top of the skin and it's reflecting those rays right on right out. So um, titanium dioxide is great. And of course, we all remember like the 50s and 60s, the zinc um, nose, the white nose, right? Well, good news, zinc has been micronized. So you can still have that protection, but it will not look like you have a white pasty nose on. So um, so yeah, the actually in one of my slides, it was the Neutrogena, the sheer yes. zinc. Okay. So that's a great one. Yeah, I have a, a, sun, a sunscreen that it goes on white, like I'm like rubbing it in. And so <laughs> And then I sometimes go into, um, I see, you know, my husband, he's like, what's wrong with your skin? I'm like, oh, sorry, I just need to rub it in some more. Um, okay, so basically uh, the physical sunscreen is preferred or at least the ones with zinc. Yeah, I wouldn't say one is preferred over the mm -hmm. other. Okay. Um, they both work well, but if you're looking to, to really minimize how much you're absorbing, I like the physical blockers better for sure. Okay. So we talked about thinning hair. Now we're going to talk about a question about facial hair. <laughs> oh, I love it. We're going to. <laughs> <laughs> what is the best way to get. A little in the other, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, we want more hair on here and less hair here. Um, yes, I hear you. Um, so Eleni, is the question. What's the best uh, way to get rid of facial hair? A treat doesn't cause skin irritation. Um back to back to the science what's causing the increased facial hair is it hormones um you, that would need to be evaluated if it's just um you know it's friends in the family you just have more hair on the chin best way to treat it would be with laser hair laser hair removal lasers have come a long way um from even 10 years ago that would be my recommendation um yeah that's what i would recommend okay if it, I will say if it is gray hair, though, laser cannot detect gray hair um, and it won't work for gray hairs. So I would recommend electrolysis, a different process. Um, yeah. yeah. So you have to physically have the hair removed as opposed to putting like. Um, like Nair or some. Yeah. yeah. Or like um, those those new machines that I see on the infomercials that you can you can use. I've seen a lot of, um, again, I always see the bad things that happen. So for mm -hmm. the thousands or millions of folks that it's done really well for, I don't, they don't walk in my office. Um, but for those who've used it, make sure you're cleaning it because it can cause like a little bit of acne if it's, um, if it's not properly cleaned. Yeah. Um, so we have, there are questions. Oh, so can you repeat this vitamin C serums that you, um, mentioned and spell them out. Yes. Yeah, so my favorite one is called Gen X C G E N X C. And that is by a company called I S clinical. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, how can you tell how many molecules are in the product? No, no. So, um, so it's the, it's the size of the molecule that we're really looking for. Uh -huh. the, the key term that I like that is consumer friendly is micronized that that's a, a good term to look for, um, because you want to make sure that it's small enough. Yeah. Okay. Not that the ones that sit on the skin won't work. It just, it's going to take you longer to get the result because so little is going to get down where it needs to. And I, you know, I, with vitamin C, is vitamin C one of those things that if you put it on, 
you have to really make sure, I guess that's retinol. Like if you put it on, yeah. really make sure that you have your sunscreen on too. Or is that just retinol? Yeah, that's retinol. But okay. it makes sense with vitamin C as well, Eleni, because vitamin C, you're usually putting it on because you want your skin to look brighter. You want to um, you want to naturally treat those brown spots and lighten them. So you don't want to spend, let's say, $200 on a product, which oftentimes that's what a good one will cost you, mm -hmm. um, and then not spend the $10 on a sunscreen and put that on. You know, you're just throwing money out the door. So that's what I would recommend. But for retinol, you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. You need the sunscreen because it makes you more sun sensitive. Sun sensitive. Okay. Cause then you get red and, and, um, okay. Yeah. Um, this one, um, one question here are thoughts about L Y T E R A. Oh, Lytera. So Lytera. I think I'm looking at the um, question. So I'm not familiar with that company. I will have to look into it. And then I will um, email Eleni my thoughts. I'll write that down and and look into it. I don't like okay. to speak on it if I'm not familiar with it. So okay, all right. So one one more question about sunscreen and eye and eye eyes. So what um, what about eye sunscreen products for right underneath the eye? These are some great questions. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I'm learning things as through these questions. So. I guess they're basically saying that there is an eye, a sunscreen created for the eye area, for the under eye area. So oh. the answer really is you don't need a different one. The same, the same sunscreen you're putting for your forehead, your chin, your cheeks, you can use for under the eye. I guess, is there maybe, maybe also to add to that, is there an eye cream tea that you would recommend too, or would you just um, so go back to any of those ones that you mentioned before? Yeah, so for if they're asking about eye cream there, I, I think it's usually for anti aging or for dark circles or puffiness. Um, I, the, the same company is clinical makes a good one. Another company that makes good medical grade products that I like their eye cream is called um, Zio. And that's literally Zio Obagi. Um, they, they make a great um, under eye cream as well. And Eleni, you know, you were, my, my skin, I'm East Asian, so my skin is dark. And for me to find a sunscreen uh, that works well with my skin tone is hard. So Zio Obagi is actually the sunscreen I use. It's called Color Tone. And you literally rub the sunscreen within your um, fingers and it changes color. Oh, and then cool. you rub it on your face and it actually looks like your skin color. The technology is really cool there. That's wonderful. Um, how do you spell that? Just to, for sure. So um, after you put Z O, it's Obagi, which is O B A G I. I would not know how to um, write that. Out. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, okay, so I don't know if we have any more questions. These are some great questions. Oh, here we go. Oh. Um, we mentioned retinol. So now any retinol pr products to recommend? <laughs> so, <laughs> great question. So over the counter, I like um, rock retinol. So that's ROC. Yeah, that and that you can get that at like your local Costco and I'm sure Sam's has it as well. Um, so that's, that's a decent over the counter retinol. Um, mm -hmm. There's some really good prescription strength ret retin-A's and um, other retinoids that work well. And Again, it's not like the retin-A you had in your 70s or 80s, which really dried and irritated your skin. Now they're so much better. So technology has changed. Yeah. Okay. So um, this person has a question. Um, they have a persistent cyst filled with um, pus. Um, it popped. So how do you treat something like that? Um, if it's recurrent which that's what it sounds like mm -hmm. it needs they need to be seen okay. yeah so it probably needs to be um drained by a medical professional yeah okay um i guess this will be the last question unless anyone else has any questions so we talked about hair skin Nail fungus. Um, any any products uh recommendations for nail growth and brittle nails. And if you, you know, have cruelty-free products too, that would be appreciated. Mm, 
Let me think about that one, Eleni, for as far as the cruelty-free products yeah. for um, nail growth, I'd have to check and make sure that they were. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a prescription product that I use and um, let me think about some over-the-counters. Again, I one. yeah. Yeah, no, I have a question. Well, this is just a question. I don't know if anyone else has experienced this past year, but how do you treat, like what's the best cream to dr dr uh, treat dry, brittle, cracked, bleeding hands. And, oh, I should have put, yes, you're so right. I should have put that in there because we're all washing our hands so much yes, more. Yes, yes. Um, so if you can basically lather up the aquaphor at night, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. But throughout the day, that's a little bit unreasonable for me to expect for, for folks. So I like um, Eucerin hand cream that works really well. It's super thick. It just goes right into the skin and hydrates mm -hmm. it um, really well. And, you know, yeah, Lenny, as we're talking through this, that's, that makes perfect sense. It's really important for folks to know that if they're in a place where they can actually use soap and water to wash their hands versus using that easy pump for hand sanitizer, please use the soap and water. You're going to be much kinder to your skin. Um, and you're, and you're going to do a great job removing any um, bacteria or viruses on your hands. So use this open water, opt for that if you're able to. For yeah. sure. Someone told me also like with, you know, uh, nails too, and in, in your hands to use um, coconut oil. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, that's actually a great recommendation. It's going to hydrate that skin beautifully. Yeah. It will. Um, I'll think a little bit more about the cruelty free for a nail growth and then I'll, I'll email that to you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, someone wrote hands at night with gloves using aquaphor. I think, yeah. So that would be a good. Yes. If you're able to do that, I love you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's hard enough for me to convince my patients to put the aquaphor on at night, but then with the gloves, you're like a gold star for, for any derm practice. <laughs> Or maybe not gloves, maybe just like cotton socks too. That will also, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank and you. And then the other thing, Eleni, is um, yeah. make sure that the lotions that they're using throughout the day are unscented. So oh. that that's important, um, unscented, because that tends to dry out the skin more and cause irritation. Okay. Thank you. I think this has been very helpful. I've learned a lot. I have a list of products now I need to go <laughs> look for this research. I appreciate it. Oh, Lenny, I um, think next time we should just do like a Q and A. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this has been so much fun. Thank you so much. And um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, I appreciate it. Don't forget to fill out that evaluation and um, have a wonderful rest of your day. Enjoy the beautiful weather, wear your sunscreen and admit your mask. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Thanks Lenny. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Bye everyone.